production. Uh, yeah, I'll say welcome again, everyone, to to this event on uh, on the new monetary policy report. Um, this is one of the first. Uh, pieces of work produced by our new 501c4 public money action that is collaborating with various other um, uh, organizations in a larger orbit, including the Modern Money Network, where a number of us are affiliated with, which is a 501c3. But in this context, we're wearing our 501c4 hat. And this document in particular is looking at um, how to reimagine uh, monetary policy in particular in, in order to address inflationary concerns that we're facing in this day and age. Um, this report actually has a pretty old history. It was, it was first conceived over two years ago. And at that point, there are a couple of different factors in the, in the mix. One was the sort of rise of the, the Green New Deal as a framework and an understanding. Um, one was the sort of general end of a, of a decade of sort of austerity dominance in the macroeconomic discourse when we were in the middle of the 2020 election, there was a lot of discussion of different big spending commitments and, and proposals. Uh, and then more, more narrowly, there was the rise of the sort of MMT, modern monetary theory framework that emphasized the, the limits of a uh, of sound finance, you know, everything must be paid for balanced budget framework and emphasize that the real limits on public spending were inflation. And in doing so, uh, reoriented a lot of focus towards the fiscal policy side, where for decades in macroeconomic discourse, the focus had been on central banking. But in doing so, we wanted to make sure there wasn't an overcorrection, that we didn't ignore the role of central banks and monetary policy more broadly, even as we were expressing skepticism about the way that it was traditionally understood as focusing on interest rates. So the kind of big question underlying this paper was, this report was, if we accept the need for social and environmental reasons to have sustained large fiscal spending in the upcoming years. If we accept that the problem in the future might not be insufficient spending, but, but an overheated economy or an economy facing inflationary barriers. And if we accept that the relevant limits on, inflation, on fiscal spending are inflation, not where we can find the money, but in, in so doing, recognizing that the limits on fiscal spending cannot be unwound or uh, extricated from other debates around the appropriate role of Wall Street and private finance and credit and all these kinds of things. How can we articulate a progressive vision for monetary policy that doesn't put all the burden on the budget on fiscal policy, but also doesn't just simply rehash the same framework we've had for years? So on that front, um, obviously, we turn to, to our resident um, economic historian and monetary policy expert, Nathan Tankus, who will go through the report. He was the lead author on this. Obviously, it was a team effort. And huge thank you to, to Michael Brennan, both for organizing this event and for making sure this paper actually got through the other side of a very long process. We wouldn't be able to uh, be here without him and all the work that he's put in. Um, but uh, I think in many respects, this was and remains Nathan's brainchild. And so I'll hand it over to him to to outline the paper and the main parts of it, and then we can come back to questions on the other side. Uh, if you have questions as you're going along, please feel free to put them in the chat and I'll collect them and, and give you a chance to either ask them or ask them myself uh, on the back end. But Nathan, why don't you take us off? Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so Ron gave the broad outlines of a lot of kind of what preceded uh, this report. I would mention specifically that Rowan and our colleague, uh, Professor Scott Fulweiler at uh, Un University of Missouri, Kansas City, uh, wrote an op-ed that was kind of uh, an impetus, a jumping off point that eventually led to this report of clear, you know, in, at a time when uh, MMT, the MMT intervention uh, was getting a lot of attention in early 2019. And in that, uh, in that piece in the Financial Times, we clarified what we thought were like a lot of misconceptions about what the MMT view was, specifically focusing on this sort of hat idea that MMT's answer to inflation is just, well, instead of the Fed deals with it, um, fiscal policy deals with it. And anytime you see any elevated um, inflation rate that we think that, you know, you should be raising taxes or cutting spending. Um, and obviously for obvious reasons, even in a time of low, of, of very low inflation, we were very concerned about that interpretation. You know, we, we, we saw various possibilities 
of situations, primarily around the idea of kind of supply chain bottlenecks and various um, disrupt disruptions that can, that can happen, especially as um, our ecological system is being destabilized, um, we were worried about that kind of interpretation of, of our work. And so we explicitly wanted to um, disavow that kind of interpretation and say, no, you know, there, while there are probably certain situations in which, you know, you want to use fiscal policy to uh, uh, reduce income, reduce the income growth overall in the economy, um, that most of the time, simply because you have an elevated inflation rate, that doesn't mean we think that, you know, fiscal policy should be uh, contracted. Um, there are various situations, which I think we're actually seeing a lot right now in uh, the pandemic um, aftermath, which I can like touch on more later. Um, but in general, there, there are just a lot of things that can disrupt that and you want focused, particularized policies to deal with those issues. You know, if can, can I jump? Can I jump in? Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I just realized I should have said at the outset. One of the things that we're seeing right now that Nathan is talking about is this idea that a number of people who are generally on the hawkish side, generally on the pro austerity side, are saying that one of the reasons we are experiencing inflation right now is because we gave too much to working class people, to middle class people in the in the pandemic, and that you know it, the reason we have inflation right now is because essentially poor people have too much purchasing power. And I think it's really important to understand that what we're experiencing right now is backlash aimed at the working class and, and people who didn't have income that were given income is exactly the thing we were trying to hold the line against with this kind of report is to, to say that we do not want to balance inflation on the backs of the unemployed or the poor. And even people like Paul Krugman days ago were saying it's time to have a bit more unemployment. We're seeing exactly the risk that we saw, that we envisaged. Exactly. And uh, so as part of that, you, know, but I'll, uh, you have to talk, about, first of all, about alternative sources of inflation and alternative policy tools. So an example I was going to give, at that time, one of the few categories in which you really saw a sustained upward movement in prices, largely like we're seeing some of the, a lot of the same issues now, was rent growth, the growth of just how much you have to pay to uh, rent for your monthly apartment when you sign a new lease. And that, that rent growth um, was, you know, one, one response you guess could have is, well, we'll raise taxes, we'll cut spending, we'll crack down on people's incomes, that will make, make it so that they can't afford uh, a certain level of, uh, of, of rent, you know, more people become homeless, more people uh, crowd together to live, um, to, uh, pack into the same apartments. And in that way, you could, you know, put on cool housing markets and try to crack down on, uh, on rental inflation. Obviously, you know, there's a, perver uh, a perversity to that kind of response. It's, you know, obviously has devastating social consequences and it's also not very effective. I mean, if you think about the period of, after the great financial crisis, it's a period where households generally are experiencing much less uh, nominal income growth, and yet still, uh, uh, growth in rents was an issue. So there's obvious alternative policy responses to um, cracking down on, on, on rent growth that often will involve actually more aggressive fiscal policy. You know, in, in other words, building more homes um, and, and, and making sure that landlords don't have, um, basically have uh, renters, uh, tenants over a barrel in terms of their bargaining power with, uh, with, with landlords, giving them some sort of you know, alternative option in the way that uh, a strong labor market, a different job offer gives you in a, uh, more negotiating power with your boss um, is an alternative way of dealing with that kind of inflation. And now, obviously, if you think, if you just think or assume that inflation, wherever it's happening in the economy, is happening because um, incomes are growing too fast and thus spending is growing too fast in general, you're not going to think that kind of intervention is, is uh, effective because you think, okay, people are saving on rent here. They're just going to spend more elsewhere. But the thing is, uh, when you actually look, 
and the numbers, even in our pandemic situation with um, disruptions in a lot of different areas, um, what you see is that uh, rather than there kind of just being, you know, the, the kind of textbook intuition that we build up, that, you know, when inflation is happening, it's having it happening everywhere, roughly at quote unquote the same rates, really you see pockets where specific sectors are seeing certain types of price dynamics, and those price dynamics are qualitatively different from a lot of other sectors. Um, and that's, and so in that context, where rather than, well, things are about to income growing too much across the board, uh, we can target uh, specific sectors uh, that, um, oh, sorry, when income, rather than being income is growing too much across the board and thus everything is being affected proportionately, instead there's these few particular sectors that are uh, experiencing sector specific issues, well then you can have a kind of much more fine tuned response to whatever is going on in that area and that will actually have an impact on say, the, the the overall rate of inflation. Um, and I'll get back to more of the pa uh, pandemic experience uh, later on, but this was kind of a major motivating uh, idea behind some of, behind the work of the report and work that we want to do following up on the report. Um, and to, you know to touch on that more, when when you think about this kind of sector specific issues. Um, and thinking about, well, there's a sector specific problem or there might be a sector specific a problem and we wanna respond, that requires much more fine grain tools, which of course uh, the Federal Reserve doesn't have or doesn't currently have. And it also respond, uh, uh, involves policy responses that are beyond the remit of, of the Federal Reserve. You know, if you wanna build more housing, you probably, whatever your pro specific approach to building more housing probably is and should involve HUD. Um, uh, uh, and uh, as so as you know, but and but there are so many issues that apply across the board. You know, obviously, if you've been paying attention to econ and finance Twitter over the last year and a half or so, you've seen many more interviews, many more coverage, many more a, a folk, much more focus on the fine-grained particularities of, say, how ports work. I mean, we've read much more, and there's been much more mainstream reporting of how the Los Angeles port works and the particular rules of the county in which uh, Los Angeles port and various other California ports, how they function, and had kind of federal debates about how can we change or over, uh, overrule specific, you know, say zoning rules in one county in California than anyone was ever considering discussing before and certainly weren't considering uh, it as an issue that has macroeconomic relevance. And these issues have come up and people have been scrambling to uh, bone up on them and integrate them into their into their macroeconomic thinking. Um, and when you're dealing with these kinds of issues, bottlenecks, structural issues in specific sectors like housing, scrambling after the fact, when you have all sorts of other problems that are happening, you know, all the other different consequences uh, and aftermath of a raging pandemic, um, that you're gonna be much more successful, much less successful policy-wise than if you proactively focus on these issues and you have some sort of framework for thinking about these issues macroeconomically. You know, we, we, this isn't the, uh, the, the main focus of the report, but a decent chunk of the report is talking about the idea of having something like the Financial Stability Oversight Council, which is looking at proactively dealing with financial stability issues, but instead for price stability, having a price stability oversight council where uh, the various agencies that regulate the ports, where the Department of Agriculture in terms of focusing on, 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 on food and uh, various commodities, uh, you know, and you know, so on and like this, you know, Department of Labor issues, obviously, um, you know, the, the Federal Reserve talks a lot about the labor market, but, and, and it is trying to influence the labor market with its monetary policy, but actual, labor law 
um, and employment law doesn't get attention or focus in that co in that conversation uh, when it obviously also has an effect on the wage dynamics in uh, uh, across the labor market. So thinking about these issues proactively and in a systemic level requires building things like a price stability oversight council to get agencies proactively looking for problems and seeing problems and figuring out how they're going to react and coming up with plans to deal with supply chain disruptions. You know, the, at the federal level, at the governmental level, our, our macroeconomic plan, whatever happens, has been the Federal Reserve is going to deal with it somehow. It's going to raise interest rates or it's going to do emergency lending to particular sectors, usually um, simply certain financial institutions, and that's going to somehow mop up whatever macroeconomic problems we encounter. And maybe if there's some particular issue, um, someone will finally convince Congress to pass some bill um, after the fact, months, years, whatever, after the fact. You know, we got lucky in the in the pandemic response of having a very quick, very large uh, fiscal action at the uh, near the beginning of the pandemic. And, you know, obviously with all of the issues that have emerged since then, it's kind of obvious in retrospect and maybe obvious to some people at the time that that, that was um, kind of a world aligning moment um, that you can't necessarily expect is going to come again. Um, and you're going to have people suddenly respond to a changing situation. We need planning and preparation for dealing with these issues. And what we and the, what we have now is what we see when we don't plan for these issues. Um, you know, before the pandemic, the big talking point among progressives was interest rates are so low, we can spend a lot of money now. Or and, and it may be a little more sophisticated. Some people would talk about inflation being so low. Thus, we can uh, spend a lot now. Um, and a big, large, relatively large programs were built up and promoted under the presumption, oh, look, we are, you know, in secular stagnation, this or that. We can, you know, go big now spending. And if, you know, we overshoot a little bit, the Fed will be able to handle it. Uh, and th that kind of justification for big progressive policies has been... Uh, really run over, you know, because now you having you have bottleneck issues coming out of the pandemic that ra that raises measured inflation rates, and when when ra inflation rates are, are measured without any sort of alternative counter narrative really dominant in the discourse, it's very easy for it's been very easy for um, uh, people to make the case that actually this is all about incomes going up too much. And thus, we need the Federal Reserve to crack down. And even um, supposedly doves, from Paul Krugman to others, to um, uh, uh, to uh, I mean, mayor, yeah, to to and to the most kind of dovish uh, members of the Federal of the Federal Reserve uh, of the FOMC, um, they have kind of all come around. Everyone agrees, quote unquote, that we need to raise interest rates. The question is just how much and how aggressively. And even the most quote unquote dovish members are talking about pretty aggressive interest rate cuts. Um, can, can I just jump in? I just wanted yeah. to, so, so the other thing I wanted to note here that Nathan is talking about the difference between having a hammer and everything looking like a nail and actually dealing with the problems where they emerge. And that's really important. But I think the other part that's important to note here is, as we're seeing today, a lot of the politics of macroeconomics are based on optics and impression. They're not based on people actually feeling what's going on in the way that it's actually going on. So right now, for example, there have been huge wage gains at the bottom level, huge increases in overall levels of employment. But if you ask the average person, a lot of them will think that the economy is doing much worse now than it was after 2009. And in part, that's because maybe they associate wage gains with their own benefits efforts and they associate inflation with the world out there that the government is responsible for. It could be that they are not linking the fact that they maybe had more income and didn't lose their house with the fact that now we're experiencing inflation, etc. But what that means is, even if our policy response is 80% correct, if we don't have a narrative that makes people understand that, we could actually lose the politics and hand it over to another generation of austerity. And if you look back to what happened 
the last time the Fed sort of solved inflation, it was the Volcker era, Paul Volcker, the chairman of the Fed in 1980, who put millions of people out of work, out of work broke the back of the union movement, and in many respects caused a global uh, uh, crisis that hurt millions of people in, in other countries who, who couldn't handle the uh, debt servicing costs on interest, uh, debt that went up on interest expense. And that has been spun even by Democrats and sort of nominally progressive people as a victory, as proof that the Fed can always handle inflation. And that today, unless we're willing to do something like that as adults, we're going to let inflation go out of control. But if you look at right now, for example, from this coordinated perspective, not only are you assessing inflation where it is, not only are you targeting the solutions to the real problems, but you're also opening up a much wider toolkit for the kind of politics that might actually keep progressive spending in the driver's seat. So just to give an example, if there was a problem in the price of milk, then we could say, let's tax Bill Gates billions of dollars, but that's not going to change the price of milk very much if Bill Gates's money is not currently being used to buy milk. But the other side of that is, if there's inflation in a certain industry right now, and we can't do much about that without hurting average people, right? If we can't deal with that too much, but one thing we can do is make their living expenses easier in other places, in other ways. We can politically offset the harm that people are experiencing at the gas pump or you know, at the grocery store with other reductions in expenses in ways that are going to make them feel like their life is better off, that they're living better conditions. And that is something that is only possible if, as Nathan said, you're looking at everything from a bird's eye view and saying all of these things relate to each other. People's gas goes up but their, and their food goes up, but their rent goes down and their cost of Netflix goes down. Maybe they feel that as a positive. But if we don't do it that way, or if they still have precarious jobs or whatever else, then maybe they'll feel that as a negative. So I just want to sort of clarify that in addition to the real economic analysis, which is really important, there's also this layer of politics and optics and electoral considerations that we are hamstringing ourselves to the politics of hurt the poor as the only way to deal with inflation right now when we assume the Fed is the, the single lever to do anything. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, I think the proactive, the, the, the importance of proactively responding to various sectoral issues before they, uh, you know, lead even temporarily to an increase uh, in uh, measured inflation rates is even more, it's much more important actually politically than it is economically. You know, economically, really, if you have a lot of wage growth going on, the low end of the labor market, tight labor markets, even with bottleneck issues in specific areas, vast majority of people are actually probably, and no, they are better off than they would be uh, otherwise, um, even if you know inflation is measured five, six, seven percent. But you know, as Warren was talking about, people experience their wages as an issue of their personal success or failure. Um, and unemployment as an issue of their personal success or failure. And they experience prices as that's something going on with the economy or the corporations or the government, um, these big uh, impersonal forces that are way beyond them at an individual level. And so because of that disconnect, when prices go up, no matter what's going on in, in, their, in their wages or even their employment situation, um, they they read one as about their personal personal issues and the rest about uh, the macro uh, economy and you know whether it's Biden's fault and, and so on. So on a pol and and not only that, but on top of that, um, we have all these ready-made political narratives about governmental failure related to elevated inflation rates, no matter how even if they're just like three or four percent uh, above where they were in years past and you know, their, you know, ongoing effects of an ongoing a global pandemic. Um, you know, the, that, that mismatch is also a reason to be really, really proactive and try to respond in, in advance. Um, it's important to create alternative narratives and promote alternative narratives, um, give people a kind of different understanding of the economy where they're connecting their uh, individual wage and employment prospects to what's going on uh, in the entire economy, 
but also, you know, it's 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 very important for whatever political project you're promoting to try uh, to try to uh, cut that issue uh, out from under it by responding proactively. And you need and and dealing with problems before they come up. You know, because if if the inflation rate doesn't get elevated in the first place, that political narrative doesn't get uh, off the ground and doesn't uh, change things. Um, and so that's. So it's important in, in these kind of twofold. You know, we, it would be managing the economy better to be proactive in this way, to have um, a, a macroeconomic framework that you were getting many more uh, administrative agencies on board, not just the Fed, um, to respond and to respond with interventions that are actually much more effective than our kind of one hammer, which is raising interest rates. Um, all that being said, and you know, kind of we're talking about a lot of different interventions. That aren't actually that aren't actually about um, aggregate demand. A lot of the report is actually uh, on the idea that okay, let's say in the extreme case that we are really are in a situation where nominal income growth is uh, accelerating too quickly, or even it's going fine, but we want to make room for additional fiscal spending, additional uh, spending responding to climate change that even in that case, it's not like you just fall back into the traditional ways of doing things. We have an alternative toolbox there as well. And this is where actually, you know, the Federal Reserve has a role and, and financial regulators more generally have a role um, that hasn't really been utilized um, basically since uh, World War II and the Korean War. Um, actually, you know, the three books of, uh, um, on my shelf are at the top are books from that era that uh, that are about the, the experience at that time um, in, in uh, largely around the work of uh, the economist Albert Hart, who was a lot, big in, inspiration for um, some parts of the report and cited in the report throughout. Um, and that is that if you're trying to crack down on income growth, yeah, you can raise taxes or cut spending. Yeah, you can try to raise interest rates, which is going to have an impact throughout the economy. And obviously, it's going to hit debtors who need to refinance um, more directly than it's going to hit anyone, and it's including going to hit um, or, uh, debtors who are in ordinary households. Um, but uh, yeah, so yeah, it's going to have this. Oh, sorry, I lost my place. Um, it's going to have this. Uh, 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 economy-wide impact, and it's going to hit certain debtors the hardest. It's also um, di directly draining purchasing power from households to have this wider impact on the rest of the uh, rest of the economy, which means they're hit first. You know, when you're doing macroeconomic policy, everyone's hit, but some groups are hit uh, disproportionately, and interest rate hikes are specific, are concentrated in hitting debtors, and of course, some of those debtors are corporations, but especially in our current economy, we have a very indebted household sector um, that would be hit, that would be hit by that uh, that kind of policy approach. And is you know as interest rates are starting to rise, uh, are getting hit right now. Um, and an alternative way of approaching that is uh, targeting rather than targeting through you know, increasing interest rate burdens, effectively cutting disposable income, you can focus on credit creation. You can focus on uh, the financing part and try and uh, pull back ration credit, make certain projects that maybe would otherwise happen not happen so that there is the, uh, the physical resources, the labor and so on available for alternative uses. And you can target certain sectors that are, are especially heavily uses, uh, heavily using certain types of products, especially say energy. Um, you know, obviously, you this requires kind of a somewhat more planning and and thought than just sort of uh, blindly hiking rates. But it is a uh, more it's it's that being more targeted, even though it's more work. Also has more benefits in terms of being more precise about the economic, the distributional impacts that you want to happen to have in the economy, and that you can avoid um, hitting 
of households that are already very de uh, distressed and uh, by by their their current debt burdens. Um, can, and, can I ask you to go into just a little bit to clarify some of the terms? Because we introduced yeah. a few terms in this paper that we're hoping will be ones that people in the policy world can incorporate and use as an alternative to simply hiking interest rates as the only way to manipulate monetary policy or, or use monetary policy to contract demand. So we had qualitative credit regulation different ways and then also some of the stuff with the CBO. So maybe you want yeah. to go into some of those terms for us? Yeah. So, I mean, in the... I'm giving kind of a broad level overview here, but obviously, you know, financial regulation is a big diverse topic. There's a lot of different tools that you could use um, to potentially have the kind of effect that I'm talking about. You could, for example, require uh, raise capital requirements, require um, banks to hit certain kind of uh, ratios between their net worth and their total assets. So, you know, their total assets are growing as they're creating money, as they're uh, creating bank deposits uh, in order to acquire loans or other type of assets. Uh, as a result, their assets will be growing, but because they're doing that through credit creation, their net worth isn't growing, or at least isn't growing immediately. You know, uh, capital, uh, capital requirements already provide some limitation on, the, on that process. And you could raise capital requirements to try to uh, restrict uh, bank cr credit growth. Um, the issue with that is there's a lot of kind of slips from the cup. There's a lot of ways to uh, uh, avoid that, which I won't get into all the details of that. But also, it's 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 a blunt in instrument that's kind of that is pretty blunt in a similar way to raising interest rates, even if it has different and in some ways have benefits relative to that kind of, that kind of approach. So in order to kind of explore what would be the best uh, uh, financial regulatory to use, uh, to use um, I have, in the report, I create a kind of taxonomy of, uh, of different types of, of financial regulation that you could use. Um, you know, the most basic dis uh, distinction is, different, is the difference between quantitative, uh, direct quantitative regulation and direct qualitative regulation. So a quantitative regulation is say, you have bank A, they can only create, you know, I'm just gonna use very kind of simple arbitrary numbers, uh, $10 billion a year in, in creating credit in, and that goes into their uh, loan growth and so on. And they can't go beyond that. You know, that's kind of very simple direct approach to capping how much a credit that they can create on a quantitative basis. Qualitative is focusing rather than on the quantities, although it can have an indirect impact on that, uh, it's focusing on the quality of the credit. It's so, you know, some banks, they might only make residential home loans. Uh, and not only do they make residential home loans, but they, uh, lend, uh, they lend to people who have very small down payments and they give them these um, big, large loans, which means they have uh, big payments to make, or maybe they uh, aren't able to amortize, meaning like pay off the loan uh, by making a set amount of payments over a defined period, say 20 years, 30 years. Um, and as a result, they're really, you know, um, turbocharging their local housing market, lending to people who uh, otherwise uh, wouldn't, wouldn't qualify, otherwise don't have enough of a down payment or at risk of being foreclosed upon because they don't have that kind of cushion provided by the equity that comes with buying with a down payment. Um, in general, you know, there's all sorts of potential financial stability risks with that. And uh, one type of qualitative regulation can be focused on what the kind of min minimum standards are. What is, you know, in, in the business called loan to value ratio of that, of that loan is. Um, and you can apply those kind of qualitative standards um, or that kind of qualitative uh, standard, which is, you know, the qu a quality of borrower standard, um, Across across the board, but there's other types of qualitative um, financial regulations that you can apply to. Uh, one type of qualitative financial regulation you can obviously apply is, in some sense, how green the project is, or alternatively, 
whether the project is a great project, whether it's a project that is going to be about, um, you know, building a pipeline, whether it's going to be about building more fossil fuel infrastructure, like say another coal plant, and you can focus uh, where banks are constricting credit on those kinds of areas, you know, the various arguments for and against, you have to have a kind of larger vision of what you're doing with uh, the country, a country's energy infrastructure, but that is one type of uh, qualitative credit regulation that you can apply that's about the quality of the sector. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, and obviously this kind of, um, there's a lot of different qualitative factors that you can uh, uh, apply in terms of what types of financial regulations that you can apply. And also you can mix and match. You can say, provide a limit of how, provide a quantitative cap of how much lending is going to be going into residential real estate or commercial real estate, which is kind of applying both a fin uh, quantitative financial regulation and a qualitative financial regulation to complement it. You know, it's kind of both at the same time. And this kind of helps us, I think it's, it's helpful you, you know, the schema, which you, you can look at the report for more details on that, of thinking through what types of financial regulations that we can, that we can apply. And in the report, I kind of conclude that these kind of direct caps of what type of lending for which sectors or for qual quality of borrowers is the best way to kind of more directly manage the macroeconomic impact you, uh, that you're having. And it's the best way of, kind of, of matching of the, the financial regulatory policy that you're pursuing with the fiscal policy you're pursuing. And this is where another term, which is more on the budgetary part that I introduced in the report, is the idea of a non-fiscal pay for. So, you know, obviously, you know, for tell people all day, every day, if you're dealing with budgetary issues, you're talking about pay for. Where, where's my pay for for this? Where's my pay for for that? Um, it's bread and, border, uh, bread and butter of Washington. I don't need to explain anything anything more really about that about that topic. Um, but in the standard uh, procedures, the, the offset that you need to pursue is just some is just some tax or spend spending cut. And it doesn't matter what the macroeconomic impact of that tax or spending cut is going to be. You can have a hundred billion dollar spending program and hey, if you want that program to be quote unquote fully paid for, you find some tax that's projected to collect $100 billion. And if that tax is applied to Wall Street, so it doesn't affect your constituents, uh, that's great. You know, you do some sort of financial transaction tax, well, that's gonna collect $100 billion. My, pro my program's $100 billion. I can propose it, great. And I can say it's fully paid for. My, my work here is done. But that uh, financial transaction tax might have very little impact in terms of reducing demand in the overall economy, um, even though it's collecting all that revenue. And so the, the kind of, you know, put crudely the kind of net effect that this is happening on aggregate demand, let alone the impact on particular sectors uh, isn't getting looked at and it can increase demand over, uh, uh, over the whole economy, uh, even though your program is fully paid for. Um, we introduced the term non-fiscal pay for to push the idea of that the CBO, Paul, uh, CB, the CBO approach needs to be totally changed if we're actually would be budgeting to manage the economy and not just do whatever we want budgetary wise and then assume that the Federal Reserve can clean it up after, which is what we did. I mean, the CBO doesn't do real, you know, its own kind of um, monthly or quarterly projection of inflation and going sector by sector to project what it thinks is going to happen in the economy because it basically more or less assumes that the Federal Reserve is, is going to manage it and follows the Federal Reserve's forecast with future inflation, which Federal Reserve always projects that in the long run, quote unquote, it's going to hit it's going to hit its 2% inflation target. So, you know, voila, the Fed is always going to hit an inflation target. We don't have to worry about the macroeconomic, macroeconomic impact of our program. But as a result, they're always scaremongering about uh, any sort of expansionary fiscal policy, since the presumption is expansionary fiscal policy is going to raise interest rates, 
those you know rate those higher interest rates are going to lead to an explosion of interest payments you know to the moon as it were and crash the economy you know it's 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 a framework that is both not equipped to uh, orient uh, CBO and Congress more generally around managing the economy and also militates against spending programs even when we need those spending programs to, uh, um, to better manage the economy and in the case of climate change, actually manage uh, the, our global ecological system. Um, so, you know, this, this is a huge problem and an alternative way is actually changing that CBO process. So the pay-fors are about offsetting the demand from whatever program that you're gonna launch and once that, once you're open the door to that, then, and it's about demand and not collecting revenue, then we have these other tools um, like the uh, financial regulatory tools that I've laid out for pulling demand from, uh, from the economy. And so, you know, this brings us a very different place in terms of managing demand, which is, you know, kind of one part of this uh, bigger project of managing the economy, avoiding avoiding bottlenecks as much as we can, um, preserve and preserve price stability. So I want to stop here, maybe, and then hopefully, if anyone's got any questions, please start thinking about them now. I just so just to summarize a little bit, and I know there's one other part of the report that we haven't talked about, which is this sort of the way that we divided the proposals into two phases, and that was really more about a tactical decision to say here's the ambitious vision for progressives and here's a vision that even sort of moderates could get behind even if they weren't willing to go whole hog here. So for people interested on the policy side, I wouldn't take those two options as sort of fixed categories, just as a sense more of how you could dip your toe in or go stronger, you know, further with the same approach. Uh, and for people going back to their own Congress people or, or thinking about this in terms of crafting policy, um, decisions going forward, you can always make you, you know your own determination of which combination of tools is most appropriate or work with us to, to identify with a particular intervention or a particular piece of legislation or a particular issue that comes up or crisis, how to, to frame a response that is going to you know, hit your particular sort of pocket of acceptable politics, given wherever you might be. Um, in, in Congress or, or with your constituents. Um, but I just want to kind of Cap, uh, summarize here, we want a world where there's going to be big progressive fiscal spending because we need it for the Green New Deal in general, but we also need it for ensuring equitable responses to crises. That cannot be assumed going forward that the only time we can do that is when we're in a general deflationary environment, when inflation is off the table or somewhere in the future. We need to be thinking about progressive fiscal spending under conditions of a hot economy or under conditions of inflation. Three, there is a role for fiscal policy there, but there is also a role for, for dealing with the, the credit side of the economy, particularly demand so that we don't fall into this trap of thinking that the only place to manage demand is on the backs of public spending, but to look at all the sources of private investment and to look at the ways in which the private financial sector uh, can manipulate prices separate from demand and cause prices to go up. And then lastly, how we might think about this in terms of our language and our procedure, not just these are the places to hit, but also here's how we can talk about inflation. Here's how we can say to the public, I support managing inflation, but I don't support hurting these programs or these groups. I support inflation, but I don't support using interest rates, which are a bad tool. I support letting the Fed or other independent actors have the discretion to respond in live time, but I want to give them the best ways to do that rather than assuming everything is a nail because we have a hammer. That's the sort of overall thrust for the takeaway for you as policymakers or as staffers is to think about how you can not ignore the problems, not ignore the question, but pivot to a different kind of answer that doesn't leave us debating how many people to throw out of work or how many kids to cut their school lunch programs and blah, 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 blah. Um, so on that front, does anyone have any particular questions they'd like to ask in the last bit of time we have here? I'd love to, things that are not sticking with people, things that are, you know, coming up against your experience, any other topics we haven't covered, questions, clarifications? And it can be questioned in chat, or you can jump on uh, audio to, to ask as well. Um, I'm wondering if you guys want to maybe throw 
this against ideas of price controls, rent controls, like alongside credit controls. So we can kind of flesh out a little bit of the policy toolkit in that expansionary Green New Deal moment and how these might hold together. Yeah, so I, I have a lot of, of uh, uh, thoughts in this, in this area. Um, you know, I, I, I bristle against the price control label because I think that price controls are associated with a very specific set of toolboxes. Um, but when we like let that label stand or, uh, or not challenge it, um, it become, um, it's very easy to dismiss any type of program that is impacts prices. Um, as well, that's just price controls and they, they failed in the seventies and so on and so forth. Um, so, you know, just like in this, you know, I, I, you know, I cite older work that calls what I'm talking about credit controls, but I don't really focus on that term uh, in the report. In the report, I talk about direct credit regulation um, because I'm talking about just one specific set type of uh, financial regulatory tools that are best suited to this kind of um, this this kind of framework and, and accomplishing this specific set of goals, but it's not like we're talking about we had a, a, a financial free market and then I'm coming in with my big bad credit controls. You know, very obviously we've had a very you know set and you know, often very constrictive set of financial regulations. They've just been aimed at accomplishing different goals than I'm looking to accomplish. Uh, we can argue about how effective that they, they've been, but we're always talking about some type of regulatory system, um, some, uh, some sort of restrictions, many sort of direct impacts on what types of behaviors are allowable or not. Um, and I don't, I, I don't particularly, you know, obviously it's a, it's a shorthand that people understand, so you make reference to credit controls, but I, I generally, you know, prefer to say what I say in the report, which is direct credit regulation. And I would focus on, on prices the same way, direct price regulation. But there are all sorts of countries that have all sorts of um, regulations that directly impact price that are not considered price controls. You know, there are countries that have, you know, um, you know, you, you, I'm forgetting the exact term that's used in certain jurisdictions, but basically there are just jurisdictions where if you raise prices too fast too quickly, you can get hit with an antitrust uh, a lawsuit uh, because you're basically it's like unfair pricing a policy so on. Um, and we're the same. The same thing happens here with 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 utilities, for example. Yeah, you know. yeah. Util utilities uh, get those kind of uh, lawsuits all the time. Particular here, utilities regulations kind of like a special uh, a special key or cordon off legally um, in the United States relative to other sorts of pricing issues, which is why I wasn't going to directly make the utilities reference. But yeah, it's, it's a, that, that's an example of having to. And more generally, as my colleague St. Jude Paul has really, really hammered home, uh, we regulate pricing in all these different ways by saying who is allowed to set prices on a particular products, who's allowed to coordinate around those products, or her work, what she calls the firm exemption, where simply because something is happening within one legal end, pricing is happening within one legal entity, uh, we say that kind of pricing, uh, court price coordination is, is fine. And then price coordination that, ha that happens um, between, you know, say two Uber drivers want to uh, turn off the app to try to get a better um, price from Uber for when the, they were still having a kind of search system. Um, well, that, you know, because they're independent contractors, is uh, would be a legal price coordination. They could potentially be sued for um, engaging in price fixing, even though, of course, Uber is setting the price of all those rides for every Uber driver. You know, that's kind of a, a classic case that's been a real focus on our work. And in my work, kind of extending on her work, in different, uh, distinct work from this, I've uh, emphasized how uh, firms are allowed to price coordinate with each other just as long as they figured out a way to do it implicitly. Um, and, uh, you know, through what's called price leadership, you know, one firm raises the price, you know, wink and a nod, another firm follows that, uh, that price increase. Um, and they're only able to do it because they've, they've reached a certain level of concentration 
where that kind of implicit coordination is, is possible, whereas it's very difficult for two individual Uber drivers to, or 20, to implicitly coordinate with, uh, with each other. Um, so in terms of the kind of things that I'm interested in, I'm interested in what kind of antitrust structure, uh, what kind of set of market governance institutions that we're encouraging or discouraging with our legal system that will um, yeah. that will impact out whether uh, price increases are happening kind of opportunistically when there are bottlenecks or whether there's kind of more of a public interest in how uh, prices are set and but you know I don't want to I'm not I'm not particularly interested in the like oh we just you know have government start declaring prices even though I recognize that it can be useful in certain circumstances yeah um let, let, I, I, yeah, I, let's yeah. Let, let's move on. I just want to clarify. So, the, the one of the reasons we don't use price controls is because it's an old term and we don't want to fight the last war. Another reason is we don't want to naturalize free market versus intervention. It's all regulated. The only question is how. There are multiple agencies that might do this, including the Fed, including the Treasury, including the CFPB, including others. But I just want to go to Arpi, who had their hand up on Stack. So, yes, would you like to share your question there, and then we'll go to to Tom's. Hi, everyone. I'm RP. I'm a legislative fellow with the Progressive Caucus. Um, I'm just wondering, this is really helpful. I have to look through your materials, wrap my mind around it a little bit more. But um, are there like any current pieces of legislation that you think are good for progressives to be pushing, like something that you've seen that we should, that you think could be like a good counter? <clears throat> and if not, what kinds of legislation should we be looking to draft? Well, we'd be certainly, so the first answer is I don't think there's anything out there right now that captures the entirety of what we're talking about. There are certainly proposals around things like antitrust. And I wanted, the other thing I wanted to just be clear is there are prices that are already being set by monetary policy. Raising interest rates is changing a price. That is a really important thing to note. All the debates we're having right now about what kind of crypto should and shouldn't be allowed is setting quantitative credit regulations within certain sectors. It's saying you can't extend credit for speculation in crypto, but you can for this or whatever else. So we are debating these things in general. What we don't have is a single, you know, we're going to give new tools to the Fed or to other agencies to manage monetary policy. We at PMA have put together large pieces of, of federal legislation for digital cash, for public banking, for regulating stable coins, etc. If there is a member of Congress interested in doing a big you know, inflation management bill that really gives a whole new set of tools, we'd happy to work with them. But rather than kind of doing piecemeal things along the way, we, we're sort of waiting for someone who's willing to take that up. So that's the first thing. In terms of other pieces of legislation, certainly some of the antitrust stuff going around, in general, this is going to probably require a large piece of new legislation. That said, the Fed currently it has relatively wide discretion on some of the ways that it chooses the cost of credit and liquidity. It could start doing some of this now. It would be better to have new legislation, but at the very least, we can start putting pressure on um, policymakers at the Fed to say, you don't have to be talking about raising interest rates right now. You don't have to be talking about labor market tightness as the problem. You can be looking at other ind individual sectors. And one example of this that we saw was providing support to state and local governments during the 2020 crisis. The idea that we could directly support those budgets while we're supporting private financial markets shows that there are other things the Fed could consider. They avoided considering that kind of stuff for 70, 80 years. So the short answer is there's no one bill I would point to on this. There are certainly some bills around automatic fiscal stabilizers where the money comes up and goes down and according to need that we could model similar things off. But one of the reasons we propose this report is because we needed to sort of kick off a conversation to get staffers even understanding the importance of this framework before we wanted to come at you with a whole piece of legislation. Yeah, I think more generally I would say is um, the other parts of the federal government have been so disused in this way that even beyond kind of kind of a kind of whole hog bill focusing on the entire framework, thinking about how say a specific bill that's meant to change how uh, you know you know the uh, the maritime I'm blanking on the exact agency but the, the maritime uh, agency that that has regulatory authority over the ports like a specific Court bill that would be about proactively uh, proactive tools that they can use to avoid avoid bottlenecks at the port. Um, 
even like spe a specific targeted bill like that, that's really thinking about how port regulation fits in on a macroeconomic scale, even like, you know, kind of quote unquote mini bills in some sense can be very, can be very useful in terms of building towards this kind of uh, this kind of framework. I mean, really, there's so much possibility in a whole array of agencies that really has not been used. I think one obvious thing I would mention is, um, and, and you know, it's it's not really something that can really do that can help a lot when we're already hitting bottleneck issues or uh, issues, you know, and especially around say Russia and wheat and oil and uh, oil and gas. But um, and we already do a little bit with the strategic oil reserve, but kind of going back to buffer stocks of um, internationally traded uh, internationally traded commodities is probably a good idea. I mean, I don't think it's a coincidence that China has such a high proportion of the kind of global uh, reserves of specific commodities because they are kind of you know, for obviously very different reasons that we're talking about here. Um, have been much more active thinking about actively managing uh, uh, the economy and avoiding um, trying to avoid it as much as possible certain types of, of problems. You know, the, the move away from having buffer stocks, which was really a very political move in the late 60s and 1970s, I don't think has actually served us well. I think it probably would be better if we had uh, buffer stocks for these kinds of things. Um, I think in general, also, we're probably going to have to rethink how we uh, how we regulate uh, international commodity exchanges because they are such a source of global price uh, instability. I mean, they were the main issue um, in uh, in the early 2010s at a time when there was a, essentially a global depression. So you can't really blame oh you know the poor or most people just have too, most households just have too much income. We were still experiencing issues uh, around around food prices uh, and to a lesser extent oil prices, to a lesser extent other commodity prices, because of the market structure, the financial structure of how commodity exchanges uh, worked, and you know it was a big part of setting off um, global rest food food riots around the world, like, which again I can't emphasize enough is in the aftermath of uh, the great financial crisis. So you can't. Um, blame income growth the way people are blaming it, uh, blaming it now. Um, so yeah, I mean, there, there are specific issues like that, but also, yeah, of course, it would be great to work on uh, a much more macro, you know, big picture bill. Yeah, and to Tom's question about does this framework providing insights for state and local governance, you know, whether a funding something to fund something that's expensive or or what to do about inflation and things, I think it certainly it does. There's two elements. One is for state and local policymakers, it, it really continues to emphasize that even under sort of hot economy conditions, even under full employment or full resource use or over resource use that we have to be managing some sort of mitigation, that there's still a unique set of powers that the federal government has vis-a-vis -vis state and local governments. It's still really important to note that it's not a matter of well, the federal government has a printing press, but when we hit inflation, we're back to being exactly the same as state and local governments. There are still unique roles that those actors up, uh, can play. And so when it comes to, for example, working out what state and local governments can do in terms of investment, but then working out who's responsible for inflation management, to say we are the ones responsible for healthcare, for transportation, for education, for housing, whatever it is at the local level, but if there's a problem, it needs to be tools that are out of our control that come back to that financial regulatory framework. That also allows state and local governments to be a source of pressure on the federal government rather than vice versa. Rather than the federal government saying, we've thrown you some money, now it's your problem to deal with, to say, we will never be able to deal with this fully. There are things that we should be doing because we're closest, but beyond that, you need to be active here. And if something goes wrong, I will be telling my constituents it's your fault. And that does change the politics. It does change, not, not to sort of lead into states' rights or anything like that, but to lead into the idea that we need to be addressing these problems at the scale that they are warranting. And that it's not, it's not the fault of local policymakers when this stuff happens. It's a, it's a national failure and the pressure needs to be put there.
Yeah, I would I would emphasize on that point that um, you know less so the, in terms of like what state and local governments can do policy wise in their individual jurisdictions that recognizing the federal government as a critical resource and a critical space in which important state and local issues get hashed out um, is, is, is critical and kind of has uh, been kind of disassembled over the last th uh, 30, 40 years. You know, my colleague, uh, Philip Rocco, um, uh, who is a professor, uh, political science professor out in Wisconsin, writes a lot about this. I mean, he's kind of really a state and local expert. Someone I tap, someone I, you know, have write for me sometimes. And one of the things he emphasizes is that in the late 60s and even into the 70s, um, uh, there were all sorts of state and local government, uh, uh, state and local government, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, uh, there are all sorts of uh, state and local, sorry, I lost my place. Um, there are all sorts of state and local government uh, organizations that were specifically about lobbying for specific sorts of federal policies and emphasize pushing for say actually automatic stabilizers, automatic, you know, cyclical, uh, cyclical uh, payments move to, uh, uh, move to the distributed to state local governments, but also um, uh, taking certain sorts of burdens off of state local government and onto the federal government. And they had, they, they were pretty relatively effective in terms of getting the kind of policies that they wanted because they were very organized. I mean, I think one of the remarkable things um, in the pandemic is how relatively uh, weak state and local governments were as a lobbying arm in terms of um, bringing sort of a lot of the kind of most critical pandemic infrastructure responsibilities up to the federal government um, in general was not an organized force in terms of the, uh, you know, governors and city governments and such getting all together to speak with one voice and being able to kind of really concentrate a lot of different political pressure. Instead, you sort of had scrambling amongst each other's, I mean, even panic buying supplies in ways that were negatively impacting a, a uh, other state and local governments. I mean, it was kind of a mess of non-coordination. Um, that's what I, uh, I would emphasize is that kind of like organizing with other state and local uh, governments for having a federal impact. The other thing I would say is being good stewards. I mean, if you really Im 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 care about, uh, you know, federal, federal stability, if you really care about contributing to these larger issues, then that means re um, redoubling on housing issues locally because you know the the issues at the, at the housing local level ultimately lead to uh federal uh federal uh uh you know, not federal but uh, uh measure rental inflation that gets uh, fed into cpi and has a negative impact on this on this whole conversation when really um, there's there's only so much the federal government can do, especially with how the U.S. is currently organized about housing without state and local governments and partners. And that means kind of um, tough fights with um, cons constituents um, and, and powerful and organized constituents who uh, don't want to, you know, say, yeah. build a lot more housing right next to them while yeah. they're building. The politics of production and price regulation do begin at home, even if the federal government's the most important player. Okay, so last question from Colin, and then we'll close it up. Colin. Hi, everyone. My name is Colin Murphy, currently finishing a policy master's degree and looking for work on the Hill. My question is, could you speak to some of the macro macroeconomic effects of the policy fixes and frameworks you presented on today for the rest of the world and especially the global south? Thanks. Yeah, I wanted to, uh, to, hit, to hit that. So I, I think it's a perfect last question. Uh, one of the things that I would really emphasize is that raising interest rates as, you know, as I think it's a, a negative uh, or not the right policy tool domestically, I think it's catastrophic internationally. I mean, you know, the, the time, you know, when Volcker raised interest rates, skyrocketed interest rates in late 70s and early 1980s, he caused a gigantic, really horrific depression uh, in the global south. I mean, there's an argument to be made that in a lot of ways, Africa never really fully recovered 
from the depression that of uh, that the U.S. instigated in that case, obviously had a huge, tremendously negative impact uh, in South America. Uh, I mean, it was just, it was it was globally devastating. And what we've seen, you know, and if anything, dollar has gotten more dominant since then. So when you raise dollar interest rates, it has this squeeze effect across the board uh, inter internationally. And you know, so the U.S. has a responsibility to uh, to other countries and to the impact that it's happening have, uh, having globally with raising interest rates. Um, and that imp that not only is that impact um, incredibly negative and ha just has a negative human cost, where I think there's just something unethical about causing it. It also uh, negatively impacts our policy goals. It means they don't have the scope that they need to respond to the pandemic, which means extending the pandemic globally and slowing a, 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 recover, a recovery from this situation and finally actually ending the pandemic. It means they have less scope to implement climate, uh, climate policies and pursue their own kind of climate spending, which means that you know less of a chance of, of averting climate change. Um, it just on all these different axes, uh, raising interest rates has this incredibly negative impact globally. Whereas if you if you pursue um, constricting demand with uh, financial regulation, you're not having those interest rate interest rate impacts globally. Um, obviously, you have to be sort of careful about uh, how your financial regulatory tools are 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 doing, but you can use. Um, direct qualitative, direct quantitative tools to focus in on a domestic economy without having as much of an impact globally. And as a result, you, uh, you'll be able to manage the domestic economy without having unintended impacts on the rest of the world. And put, putting the situation where, you know, while there still are issues with having the rest of the world so deeply indebted in dollars, um, this sort of depression effect from uh, really uh, sharply raising U U.S. interest rates isn't going to happen, and you don't have that knock-on effect on their exchange rates and so on. So I think it's 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 really really important um, on 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 that. You know, something we don't really you know is beyond the scope to really talk about the report is that of course uh, there are you know tools for providing support for other countries to. Uh, uh, in, uh, to implement their own Green New Deals, which can happen through the Fed, through um, uh, tools like uh, uh, central bank liquidity swaps, which of course is something we engage in to support specific countries, kind of favored nations in implementing their, um, their response to the pandemic. But um, you're gonna need to do on a different basis if we're actually trying to get uh, the globe and not just our friends respond uh, to respond to things like climate change. Of course, there's you know complicated issues in there, but it's it's a. I think you know the the biggest thing in terms of what I talked about today is kind of a do no harm principle and focusing on financial regulatory tools rather than raising interest rates is very much a do no harm, not doing harm versus really doing harm in terms of the in terms of the global south. Yeah, I mean, we, we talk about the way that interest rates can have dual effects. You know, you think it's constraining credit in this way, but it's actually paying more interest to others in a way that helps the rich get richer in other ways or whatever else, or maybe the wealthy pensioners against people who don't have pensions. But at the international level, a lot of those dynamics of the, the dual effects or the sort of contradictory effects of interest rates are that much more pronounced. And often it's the people in the global South that suffer and it's the rich and wealthy around the world that benefit from those higher rates, et cetera. The other thing I want to note on top of what Nathan said is that the idea that interest rates are the only tool that central bankers can use is itself a very American and British framework for monetary Absolutely. policy that has its historical origins in the 80s with the dominance of Thatcher and Reagan. And if you want to learn more about this and want to understand how what we're proposing actually is a lot closer to the way that the Global South has thought about using monetary policy and credit regulation, because we can often use China as the alternative and say, oh, they do credit stuff, but they're a communist country or something. But the reality is, everyone who isn't the US and the UK or under the orbit of their central banking regime 
has used a much wider toolkit in the past. And what we're proposing is to bring back a lot of those tools or bring them to America and in a sense, decolonize or de-imperialify our own monetary policy. So I'm going to share a, a book in the chat called Controlling Credit by a central bank historian at the Bank of France, Eric Monet, talking about the history of a lot of similar tools that we're talking about, albeit maybe sort of outdated now or behind the times, but similar framework and how this was actually the dominant model for a lot of European and other countries in the post-war period before that American British hegemony yeah. then, took over. And there's other literature about other country, other countries as well that it focuses more in on say the Latin American experience or the South Korean experience. I mean, the one thing I'd mentioned, you know, people try to strong man credit, uh, credit, direct credit regulation with China. Well, Taiwan did it. Uh, use those tools and was a big part of their success and big part of their ongoing success um, when when they did it as well. So you know it's 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 you know if, if it can cross the Taiwan Taiwan China divide, then it's kind of a much more universal tool, except for this kind of Anglo-American consensus, which uh, what you know was promoted everywhere by uh, the Washington consensus. All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for turning up and, and sticking it out. We very much appreciate it. This video will be up as a resource, but uh, please keep in touch. And if this and other related issues sound of interest, please always feel free to reach out to us and others at Public Money Action. We're always happy to help and work with you on any legislation or even just talking through some of these issues as you formulate strategy or questions for um, for you know congressional hearings, things like that. We, we're standing by to help anyone on the progressive side that wants a different kind of macroeconomic paradigm than we've seen in the last few decades. So thank you very much for attending and see you on the other side.